Thanks first to the department chair, Scott Levi, who initiated this series. The committee that worked very hard from the start to come up with the fantastic list of scholars um, that we worked with uh, in order to, or the, the scholars that, from which we chose um, the uh, presenters. It was a fantastic list um, and, and it, was, um, it was just really exciting. Um, I want to also thank all those speakers, even though they're not here right now. They they helped to educate us further. They entertained us, and they just helped us to think harder. Thanks also to the staff persons in the history department who have arranged lodging and travel back when we could travel. Um, they've made posters, paid bills, and they and they they've done and they still do a lot of paperwork to make this series uh, happen. Um, and in particular, I just want to um, name Rhonda Maynard and Chris Adams and Steve McCann, who've done a lot of bureaucratic work for this, uh, not just bureaucratic, but a lot of work for this uh, series. Um, thank you, Department of History, for all that extra help. And Laura Seeger, how could I forget <laughs> Laura Seeger, who, um, who helps us in so many ways with lots of technical issues and more. Um, so thank you to the history department for all that help, to the Department of African and African American Studies, um, the Center for Historical Studies, especially John Brooke. And thank you to Dr. James Moore, Director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the Ohio Energy Partners for their generous and critical financial support, uh, which started with their belief in the importance of this series. This whole year's series would have been a casualty of COVID without their support. Finally, thank you to the audience here today. Thank you for showing up. Throughout this series, throughout this series, the audience has been critical to our success. And again, you know, I know that today is going to be no different. Um, we know, and please be assured that we know that even with the constraints that COVID has put on our movements, you still could have chosen to be someplace else this Friday afternoon. So thank you for choosing to be here. Um, I will turn my, um, my video off and turn this over to my colleague, Hassan Jeffries, to introduce our distinguished guest and today's program. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Shaw, Stephanie. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for all of your work um, as long as well with all of the folk who you have mentioned, both sponsors uh, and co-sponsors, members and faculty of the history department and staff as well, who have really made it possible for us to have this fantastic series that is now uh, going into its second year. Um, I'm Hassan Kwame Jeffries, Associate Professor of History in the Department of History, uh, where I teach and research on uh, African American history in general and specifically uh, the civil rights and black power movement moving into uh, the contemporary era. Um, just a little bit about format before I uh, introduce uh, our, our, our guest, for, our special guest for today, uh, Ms. Judy Richardson. We will, uh, Ms. Richardson and I will have a little bit of a conversation and, and, and discussion uh, for, uh, it will, will take us uh, roundabout uh, to the, uh, the 5.30 uh, mark. Um, in this, we will explore uh, eyes on the prize. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Richardson has, has, has selected a few clips. Uh, and if I can get this technology to work right for me, we'll, we'll, we'll share a few clips um, going in uh, and have a little discussion about that from this phenomenal, phenomenal historic series. Um, but you as participants, uh, we want to uh, engage with you as well. Um, the chat function is open and available. Um, and I encourage you to share thoughts and ideas and resources as we, as we go along. Uh, our colleague, uh, John Brooke, Dr. John Brooke, will be keeping an eye on the chat as I, as, as, as I will as well. Uh, but if you have questions, we are at around 5.30, we will have a Q&A session. Um, and so uh, at 5.30, uh, we will invite you in to be a part of that part of this presentation, uh, that part of our time together. So you will notice the Q&A um, a tab, uh, please put your questions in there. Um, uh, John uh, will keep an eye on that. Uh, I'll keep an eye on that. And when we get to uh, that part, then we will invite you in and take some of those questions. So if you have questions, 
uh, about eyes, you have questions for Ms. Richardson, please put them in there. Uh, we'll keep an eye on them and we'll try to get to as many as, as possible. Now, uh, it is my distinct pleasure and a true honor uh, to, to introduce uh, to some of you, because uh, I know many on here already know her, uh, Miss Judy Richardson. Let me give you a little bit of a back, little, little bio, little background, um, and then we will invite, we will hear from her, her directly. Uh, Judy Richardson was on SNCC staff uh, from 1963 to 1966, working in Atlanta's national, uh, SNCC's at, at a national office in Atlanta, also working in uh, Mississippi during uh, 1964 Freedom Summer, working in Lowndes County. I remember asking her for the first time uh, I, was a, I was a young pup in graduate school uh, going, I'll say, Ms. Richardson, can I ask you about Lowndes County? And I don't know, Judy, if you remember, you were like, I don't remember nothing about that. And I was like, oh, I was like, I was counting on you. I was counting on you. Uh, so, uh, and, and then, but beyond that, uh, and so, so, so many of us know her uh, from uh, this critical role that she played within SNCC, um, you know, during its, during its, it, when it was active, uh, but that, did, that wasn't the end of her activism. Uh, she goes on from there to found, uh, co-found Drum and Spear Bookstore in Washington, D.C., which many of you know, would know at one point was the largest African-American bookstore in the country. Uh, and some of you may know her from there, but that wasn't the end of Judy Richardson either. Uh, then she goes on to have just an amazing career uh, working in film uh, and, and, and being a part of numerous documentaries, uh, just one of which is Eyes on the Prize. Uh, those who have uh, taken my uh, film class on um, uh, African-American history through film uh, and even the civil rights class are going to be familiar uh, with another one of the projects that she was uh, played an intimate role in, Malcolm X's uh, Make It Plain. Uh, and so, the, and the list goes on. Her full bio you can find in the link um, to, uh, that we have for this, for this presentation. Uh, but Judy is also a, um, a, a civil rights historian I'm going to tell it. I'm going to say it. I'm giving it a civil rights historian, a co-editor with five other SNCC women of just the uh, just a phenomenal um, uh, a book that allows uh, everyone to sort of take a look into SNCC and the women of SNCC uh, and their experiences. It's just a, a marvelous window into not just the organization, but the civil rights movement as a whole. Hands on the Freedom Plow, personal accounts by women in SNCC. 52 SNCC women contributed uh, to that. And then, of course, uh, SNCC as a physical organization uh, is, isn't here any longer, but the people who were SNCC are still here. Uh, and so Judy has played, uh, is an instrumental uh, 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 part uh, on the board of the SNCC Legacy Project uh, that is keeping not just the history of SNCC uh, and the memory of SNCC, but the activism, the spirit of SNCC still alive through projects like uh, the SNCC uh, and the Duke University uh, partnership, the SNCC Digital Gateway, in which we used to get to hang out a little bit uh, pre-COVID. Uh, so we'll have to we'll we'll have to get back there soon, hopefully sometime sometime soon. So that's just a snippet, a little bit uh, of why uh, we are so excited to have uh, Judy Richardson with us for this hour plus uh, to talk a little bit about civil rights history, talk a little personal history and personal involvement, and especially to talk about. Um, eyes on the prize, uh, both as a, uh, a documentary uh, and as a document, a piece of, of history itself. So, so Judy Richardson, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Hassan. It's just wonderful to be here. Uh, great, great. So, you know, eyes on the prize. For those who uh, are familiar, for those who aren't familiar, I'm just going to say two quick things. It is still, in my opinion, the gold standard of documentary films on the civil rights movement. It is where you begin. It is where it is what you will come back to, and it is it is where you will end as well. Um, Fourteen hour series that first aired in 1987 on PBS. I saw it for the first time uh, in in you know in 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 high school. My, my, my dad was like, come on, come on, come sit, come sit. We're going to watch this, right? And uh, Channel 13 in New York City, right? WN, I think it's WNYC, right? And, NET, and, and, WNET. WNET. Uh, and, and that was my exposure, right? And then I couldn't get it again. We just had to wait. You catch pieces when it re-aired on PBS. But, but for those who did not have that, that, that experience, right? Could you just 
share a little bit of background and tell us what 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 is because it's not a was what is eyes on the prize mm -hmm. well it's thank you that's a great intro um but it, it's basically it's 14 hours um when henry hampton the head of black side because this was a black company that produced it with a lot of different folks um, as producers editors ap's all kinds of stuff it's a big team but when we first started it was it was going to be one hour but then it becomes 14 hours. So the first six hours that aired in 1987 um, aired every hour on all the PBS stations nationally. And that went started with Emma Till. So you got a sense of this young man. And um, so when you saw um, the nonviolent direct action, you understood why they had to be nonviolent because you saw what happened to 14 year old Emma Till um, when he wasn't doing anything. Um, and so uh, it starts with Emma Till and goes through the sit-ins, the Freedom Rides, Birmingham, uh, March on Washington and ends that first series uh, of six hours ends with the Selma to Montgomery voting rights march. And then this, and of course has the bus boycott as well and school desegregation. Um, and then the second series picks up where the first series uh, end, ended out, ended. And uh, so it picks up uh, and is eight hours and that aired in 1980, in 1990. Mm -hmm. And that's eight hours and it goes from, um, starts with Malcolm X and the rebellion in, in Florida, in Liberty City, as always around police brutality. And then it goes through the Detroit rebellions through, um, Oh, the 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 uh, sit, um, the uh, taking over of Howard University um, to try and make it actually a black university, um, and through the Attica rebellions and the assassinations of the, the Black Panthers in Chicago, Hampton and Clark, and then um, ends in nineteen about mid nineteen eighties uh, with the election of Harold Washington as the first black mayor of Washington of of uh, uh, Chicago, and so altogether it became fourteen hours. First, the first six hours, and then the second eight hours. Could you could you say a little something about how it was received in the moment? Uh, what was what was some of the reaction uh, to to this uh, doc documentary at the time? I mean, now we look at it and it's like this is a classic. This is phenomenal. Was it received the same way at the time? It was, and you know, it's so funny. I was, when it aired, I was actually in New York because at the time I had moved back down to New York and I was working with the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice um, on police brutality issues. Mm. And so I, I'm not, you know, I knew that the New York Times, for example, um, gave it a glowing review. Um, uh, we got out of that, we got um, an Academy Award nomination, went out, didn't get it somewhat pissed about that. Um, and then six Emmys, uh, we got the highest um, journalism award uh, from the Columbia DuPont, um, from, it was called the Columbia DuPont um, Award. And it was for the highest, um, um, highest excellence in journalism. And it's because we were so, and we can get to that, um, so journalistically grounded, so factually grounded. But uh, when it came out, yeah, it was actually, it was really well received, but not as wide as it became. I mean, it really was um, kind of word of mouth. And also it then becomes um, kind of the, a bedrock uh, with, um, it was in about 40% of all four-year colleges. It was in a lot of libraries and schools and, and continues to be. And, um, and so it, there's almost a second life in terms of the way community centers and social activists and schools and um, began to use it. But yeah, initially we, we got more than I think we ever thought we'd get, you know, in terms of acclaim. Yeah. What was, um, what was available, if you remember, if you, if, if thinking back at the time as, as, as you're um, working on this, and we'll talk more about your role a little bit later on, this is still the overview part, so we won't get to, we'll give everything away. But what was available at the time? If it wasn't for Eyes on the Prize, what could people turn to in 1987 to learn about the movement if they needed a, a video cassette, if they wanted a little bit of history to actually show somebody or learn from. Do you remember? Yeah, because I remember when we first started working on that one hour and at that point, and even in 87, all you, all you had was Montgomery to Memphis. 
And Montgomery to Memphis was the documentary that is totally focused on Dr. King. And, and nobody, you know, would in any way um, take away from the greatness because the man was a great man, you know. But, um, but that's all you saw. And so what you saw was um, Dr. King, and even when he went into Birmingham, you only saw Dr. King. You didn't see Reverend Shuttlesworth, who had been plowing those grounds in Birmingham forever. When he goes in, when Dr. King goes into Selma in the documentary Montgomery to Memphis, um, you don't see the hard work of Amelia and, and her husband, William Boynton, and the work that they've been doing since the 1940s, you know, on voting, voter registration in Selma, Alabama. You didn't see any of the regular people who had been the bulwark of that movement going into, into Montgomery. You didn't see Claudette Colvin or, or really who Rosa Parks was or um, Joanne Robinson. And we can talk about that story and how I finally discovered where she is. Um, but you didn't hear, see any of the people who were not just the troops, but the leaders in those local movements. All you saw was Dr. King. And, and see, see, the problem with that is if you, because it's a deliberate thing. I mean, it's not just somebody said, oh, we're only going to say, you know, show Dr. King. Um, it's because the danger is if people like all of us you know, on this call, if we don't know that folks just like us were the ones who made the movement, you know, our cousins, our pastors, our, you know, uh, rabbis, whatever they were, our neighbors, they were the ones who were the leaders and the troops in this movement. If we don't know that, then we don't know we can do it again. You know, we're waiting around for, oh, somebody as great as Dr. King. And now there were lots of great people in this movement and they weren't just the, the foot soldiers. You know, they were the leaders and the ones who started it. So that's what Eyes on the Prize does. It shows what, um, what well, I won't get into that because your question is um, <laughs> what was out there. So that's what was out there. Yeah, well, it, it, there's something also special about Eyes on the Prize, and that's why we frame this conversation as as both a documentary and document. Could you say because because Eyes on the Prize looks different, it feels different. There's something now. Not everybody can pick up on what's so unique and different about it. Could you say a little bit about? I'm going to frame the question as this: about what Eyes is not in terms of a documentary film. Well, first of all, it's not um, it's not recreations. We were not allowed to do any recreations. If you see it in Eyes on the Prize, it is the actual footage um, of that event and of that day. Because we don't treat it, people call, you know, filmmakers call it B-roll. You know, it's the, the folks who are, you know, uh, marching across the screen when you hear the narration or somebody being interviewed. Um, if you see it in Eyes on the Prize and we're showing it for day three of the Selma March, it will be day three. It won't even be day 10, it'll be day three. Um, and one of the things that I often get from teachers and continue to get from teachers is sometimes their, their, their students don't believe that something happened, no matter how much the teacher talks about it, until they see it in Eyes on the Prize in black and white. You know, cause then again, a lot of that footage is black and white, but it's the real footage. We don't have, um, for example, we, we, don't have, um, we don't have scholars actually being interviewed. I mean, what Eyes on the Prize does is it storytells the civil rights movement from the perspective of those who actually experienced the events in that series. So you're gonna get the activists, you're gonna get the other side, you're gonna get the white supremacists even, you're gonna get the journalists, you're gonna get the government folk. But the scholars, the way we, we use the scholars was um, to ground us in the history so that we wouldn't go off the mark. I mean, to remember, this is a black film company that has never done a series before. And again, it's a black film company talking about the civil rights movement. And so we, you know, Henry Hampton, the head of black side who, who um, envisioned this, um, he wanted to make sure that if you're gonna come at us, you cannot come at us in terms of the factual information. And so, Yes, we are grounded by all of the, the, the early movement scholars. I mean, you know, again, remember, we don't have all of those, the, um, the kind of movement scholarship that you did on Lowndes County. If I had only had you when we were doing Lowndes, you know, um, we didn't have you. We didn't have um, John Dittmer, who, you know, starts with, with local movement in Mississippi. We didn't have Charles Payne. We didn't have Jean Theo Harris doing Montgomery. We didn't have Emily Crosby doing the local movement in Mississippi. We didn't have any of you all, you know, so we're going off the very slim local movement scholarship that is not just talking about Dr. King. And the other problem is, of course, neutering him. But we can talk about that later. Um, so, you know, nobody knew about Dr. King 
besides Montgomery and um, March on Washington. So one, what we do is we talk about um, the civil rights movement from the perspective, we storytell it from the perspective of those who actually lived it. And we put it in a three act structure. I mean, that's the thing, when, we, when I say we storytell it, we really did. I mean, it was, you know, Henry's thing and the writer Steve Fair and, and the other writers on the project. Steve's thing was, this is how you tell it in a regular three act structure. And so everything was divided into acts, you know, and again, only no recreations, all archival. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that really speaks to the, the film as document um, in terms of, and, and, and the interviews that were done. We'll talk a little bit more about that. I mean, which are now available online uh, at Washington University. I mean, it's just phenomenal archive uh, and resource that you can really build beyond uh, after consuming the film, right? Because we all know just a fraction of those interviews are ever will ever make air just because you know six hours and fourteen hours become four hundred hours if you include if you include all of that. You know, Judy, I, I want us to pivot. We'll pivot in oh, a I'm second. Sorry. It was one, oh, one of the key things I forgot. Yes. The other thing we do is we tell it from the bottom up, like oh, all of you all movement historians do now. You know, yeah. the, not all of you, the good ones, excuse me, the local movement historians who talk about all the folks who are plowing on that ground. It's not, it's not top down, it is bottom yeah. up. And yeah. that's what eyes really um, premieres. You know, that's, that's what it's grounded on. And I think that's also part of why it also explains his staying power, because if, if it was just about King and two other people, you know, eventually that story, you know, like, I don't see me, I don't learn anything different. But the fact that it is so focused on ordinary people on the ground and that you see it and it's, it's like, wow, I didn't know. You keep watching. Like, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. And I think that and we still don't know. We're still learning. Um, and I think that helps explain its staying power because it just introduces you to so many people and introduces you to the movement the way it should, but just so many people, so many people. So I, 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 want, I, want, I want those who are on to learn a little bit more about Judy Richardson and how you came to, um, to work on Eyes on a Prize. But, but first you called the name of Henry Hampton. Um, and 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 if we could, I want to ask you a little bit because you you've shared this this memo, and I'm going to pull it up now, uh, because this speaks to sort of the beginnings, if you will, of Eyes on the Prize. Uh, you you shared this naming memo, um, and and hopefully everybody can see it now. You can look in a little bit of uh, look in a little tight, squint a little bit, get closer to get close to your uh, uh, screens if you need to. Um, from October 9th, 1979, uh, that list. Uh, potential program titles. Could you say a little bit about what this is uh, and what was what was the thinking uh, behind it and you know kind of what where Henry Hampton was in envisioning what this would look like? Absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, when I start working on Eyes, it's not called Eyes and it's going to be a one hour documentary on the movement, the first six hours, what becomes the first six hours. Um, and, um, you know, Henry always had this idea that you know, as he said, nothing takes longer than six months to do. And so I come up, I have no experience, no ex zilch, zed, nada experience in film. But Henry assumes that I can help get interviews with some of the movement people because, you know, maybe the people, at least, you know, some movement people may know me. Um, and so, uh, but I'm sitting up there by myself for the first six months and I'm reading, as a matter of fact, Simple Justice was the first time I saw a history book because again, it's before you all come out. And so um, it's the first time I saw a history book that actually story told. And in that case, it was the Brown v. Board cases. Right. And it was like, oh my God, this is fascinating. But there wasn't that much out. So I'm sitting there by myself, but Henry had this other title. And Henry's title was America, We Loved You Madly. Now, he loved that title because it was also actually from you know a, a song-based thing, but it was what um, Duke Ellington, the great band leader would say. He would, at the end of a concert, he would come out to the audience to the edge of the stage and he would throw his arms out and he'd say, I love you madly. Now, Henry loved language. And so he liked the play on words of madly. So black folks have, they're mad and they're mad. You know I mean? So um, that relationship with this country. And so, um, so he had this title and I said, you know, I don't like it, but, what do I know? You know, 
but I kept up with it. And then finally we get some, the, the money to start what really becomes the, the, the early stages from Capital Cities Communications. And um, at that point they, you know, they owned small stations, TV stations, um, uh, and they wanted to do more minority programming. So Henry uh, put in a proposal, he gets the money. And then we finally get the money. Again, this is before it becomes the real eyes, right? It's gonna be one hour. And um, so this is 1979, 78, 79, Henry Johnson um, is the producer director. I mean, it's this whole thing. And so um, uh, we finally get the crew on. And so that's when I do this, this memo. Cause I'm, cause I'm talking to other, to the crew and the production team I'm saying, I really hate the title. And they said, we do too. Okay. So <laughs> I, I put this on and I had thought about, well, you know, if we tie it into a, a, a freedom song that would work, you know? So it says, y'all know how much I dislike the current working title. I have therefore perused freedom song titles for alternatives. Here is the list, not wedded to any of these titles, although there's some I kind of like. Circulating this mainly to get us thinking about other possibilities. Also, since they're all related to freedom songs, there's a tie-in nationally, uh, musically, and, and you know, think about reworking some, there's no order preference. So I then put on 21. One, moving on, we'll never turn back. Um, uh, they will not be moved. And then um, I have number, oh, well, number six is the one number he chose, chooses. And it's their eyes on the prize or keep your eyes on the prize. Okay, so that's my number six. Then if you go all the way down, you see number 22. And I'll say, we placed our trust in the Lord, dot, dot, dot. This is a made up title. And they beat the mm -mm out of us anyway. <laughs> Okay, and then I have a little asterisk with that and at the bottom it says my, my favorite. Okay, so I put these down and he finally, I mean, it's only because the rest of the Cap Capital Cities Communications team, this early version says, we don't like the title either. She not alone, you know. So um, we end up at the very end, almost just as he's, you know, we have to do all the post-production, we got to put the title on, he chooses, eyes on the prize. And, um, it's funny because Steve Fair told me, I mean, first of all, he, he sent me this memo because I had lost it. He sends it to me. And when he sends it to me, Steve Fair, the, 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 uh, the series writer says, you know, up until the end, I told Henry, you chose the wrong title. You know, you don't know. This, this is a white guy who was a wonderful writer. And he said, um, you know, you chose the wrong title. They're going to make fun of it. They're not going to get it, you know, so much. <laughs> And, wow. but Henry stuck with it. You know, once he decided it, that's what it was going to be. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, because, you know, history has testifies to the fact that you, I can't even conceive of this being anything else. And, 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 and so much so that when you hear the song and I listen to movement music all the time, I'm immediately drawn right to, to the documentary. I immediately think of the document and I think about myself sitting in Brooklyn, New York, watching it on PBS in New York. I mean, that's what that's where I go back. I mean, the association of it. So it's just amazing to have that little bit of history for, for how the title came about, right? I mean, the, you, as, as someone who writes books, people ask, oh, where'd you get the title from? Oh, let me tell you that story. I mean, this is, this is literally, literally one of those. So uh, a little bit of your story, uh, uh, Judy. Um, so we, you're, and, and I'm gonna, I want to pull up another, uh, another image to share with, with everyone. Um, you're from Terrytown, New York, home of Washington Irving. Yes, Washington, home of Washington Irving. You, you, you make your way to Swarthmore, uh, and then next thing you know, you're in the middle of the mayhem of the movement. Now nothing happens that simply. So how do we, how do we go from New York? to suddenly being on the front lines of, of, of the revolution. Mm -hmm. Well, I gotta tell you, my mother, and by the way, I'm the one looking vacantly into space in the middle there. Um, I, you know, I think a lot of it comes from my mother who never talked about race, let me just say. My mother had an eighth grade education. Uh, my father had been one of the organizers, had worked at the plant, everybody's father worked at the plant. I lived under the hill in Tarrytown, which is about, um, Oh, 40 minutes north of New York City. Um, and uh, everybody's father whom I knew, I mean, all my friends, their fathers worked at the plant. It was the auto part, uh, auto part plant for Chevrolet cars. You could tell time by the, the shifts coming out of the plant. My father um, helps organize it. And then, and he becomes treasurer of the local, still working on the line, on the assembly line. 
And when I'm seven years old, I'm pulled out of class because my father has had a heart attack and died. Mm -hmm. And so my mother with her eighth grade education read everything. I mean, she, she would look at Meet the Press on TV. She's reading the Post, New York Post, when the Post was actually a, a real paper and stuff. You know, it was all of that. Um, so she is very much in the world, but she never talked about race. Mm -hmm. And I had an older sister, um, Karita. And um, so um, I have this, I mean, my mother uh, had this sense of the labor movement, but I didn't get the other stuff. Um, I, we always got the Jet and the Ebony Magazine, but that's about it, you know. Um, my sister goes to Bennington College on a full scholarship. I then get a full four-year scholarship to Swarthmore. Had never heard of it before. I go there and I find out, oh, this is, you know, kind of a leaked school here in Pennsylvania. Um, my mother is very proud and drives me down, you know, I, or rather lets me drive down, which I would never have done knowing how little. Well, anyway, so we drive down from Tarrytown. And um, uh, when I get there, you know, I'm, I'm scoping everything out. And then I go to this meeting of what is called SDS. And SDS was the Students for a Democratic Society, uh, which was a northern, a group of a national student group, primarily in, in north, on northern campuses, progressive very much in support of SMIC and the Southern movement and the sit-ins. What, what, so, what year would that have been? Oh, right, okay. I go um, down to, to Swarthmore in 62. Okay. So I'm the, my freshman year is 1962 to 63. Okay. And um, while I'm there, I, you know, I'm trying to find out what's going on, right? And so I go to this meeting of this SDS groups, Students for Democratic Society, and it's called SPAC, the local chapter on Swarthmore's campus was called the Swarthmore Political Action Committee, SPAC. So I go there and I find out that there are two co-directors, um, Mimi Feingold and Carl Whitman. Oh my God, I remember their names. Okay, so they are the two co-directors. Mimi, I did not know until some of us, oh, some of us from Hands go down to Swarthmore years later when we're doing um, Hands on the Freedom Plow and Swarthmore gave us an entire day. Uh, but I didn't know until then that, um, uh, Mimi had spent the, the previous six months or maybe a year in core in Plaquemine County in Louisiana, which was deadly. I mean, if we thought Mississippi was bad, honey, Plaquemine County, Louisiana was, whoa. I did not know she had just come back from that to complete her, I think her senior year. So she then is the co-chair of this SDS chapter, SPAC. And then her other co, her co-chair is um, Carl Whitman, who later becomes very big in, in um, the, the, the gay rights movement, moves to California, da, 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 da. Okay, so they are though that. And I come in and again, I'm going to this meeting only cause my mother's not there to stop me. I have no great you know, interest in what's going on and stuff, but I find out that first of all, they're, um, they're organizing, um, they have three things, but they're organizing the all black, all female cafeteria staff at Swarthmore. Now Swarthmore is a prestigious um, Quaker college, right? But all the staff is black and female um, and they were trying to fight for better wages. And um, I'm working with them because I'm work study. So I'm in the dining room. Now, again, this is Swarthmore. So nobody's busting their own tables. You know, We got a big oaken table and people come in and they eat, they sit down and they eat and the wait staff comes and they bring them to the table. Um, including me, maybe two day, two nights a, a week. So um, one of the things that the waitress, this, well, all right, I won't go through all this, too long a story, but the bottom line is that's one of the things they're working on. They're organizing with the local, uh, the, with the uh, waitress staff, including me, um, uh, around better wages at Swarthmore. They're also working in Chester, Pennsylvania, which Pennsylvania, which was even then segregated. And then the third thing they're doing is working with the Cambridge, Maryland movement on the Eastern Shore of Maryland uh, around public accommodations because everything in Cambridge, Maryland at that time was totally segregated. Black folks had the vote, but they couldn't go, you know, in any place beyond the, the black community. And so that organization, that 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 um, CNAC, uh, Cambridge Nonviolent Action Community uh, Committee, was headed by this amazing black woman, uh, Gloria Richardson. And so I start going down um, to this locally based grassroots movement because, and it turns out it was a, a SNCC, SNCC um, affiliate. Uh, and, and so um, I find Reggie Robinson who had been born and raised in, in Baltimore. He's the SNCC field secretary organizing there. 
And at some point, you know, I'm going back and forth. Somebody comes back, Penny Patch comes back from uh, Southwest Georgia. She's a Swarthmore student. She had been in Southwest Georgia with, Smith, with um, SNCC. And she says, look, I hear that you've been arrested. You keep getting arrested over the weekend. You're not in class on Monday. Why don't you just take off, you know, the next semester, which would have been 63, fall of 63. Take off the first semester of your, your, your sophomore year. You can come back. I check, no problem. I'm gonna keep the four-year scholarship. Then I call my mother, you know, and she says, um, on the whole, too much information, but it basically whole phone is the whole phone. And, you know, cause nobody had cell phones, you know? And so, um, so she's amazingly calm because then the next one who calls me is my older sister who screams on the phone that, you know, what do you think you're doing? So, but I do take off what is supposed to be only that first semester. And, um, and I go to, I do the summer job. I go down, I work with Cambridge. And then Reggie Robinson, the SNCC field secretary says, hey, I'm, I'm headed down to the national office. We're gonna come back. Why don't you come, come go with us? I said, okay, fine. So we go, we go down and I get to the national office and um, I see, um, you know, it's, it's my first image of this amazing group of young people, you know, who are my age, most of them look like me. And I often say they're changing the world as I know it. You know, I mean, it's good golly. You know, who are these people? It's Julian Bond, it's Ruby Dar Smith Robinson who would, you know, um, been in, in uh, Parchman Prison from the Freedom Rides. And um, it's Jim Foreman, the executive secretary. It's all of these incredible people. And they are my age, 17, 18, 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And so there's Julian, you know, typing, Julian Bond, typing on his, his typewriter with the cigarette hanging out of his mouth. Um, and he's communications director. And there's Ruby Dar Smith Robinson administrating and, and trying to uh, make sure that the folks who are in jail in Mississippi or Alabama are, are getting taken care of. We have a Watts line that we're communicating with people on. We have a research department run by this crusty old white guy who could get research from a stone, Jack Minist. We had um, uh, uh, people, uh, we had a print shop, you know, so that we could get out the student voice every month to all the friends of Strick SNCC because we had a network of campus friends of SNCC and regular friends of SNCC and Lorraine Hansberg and, and oh, Belafonte, you know, and fundraising, all these things are being done by folks who are my age, you know. So that young thing is what, oh, I went on for too long. So I'm gonna stop there. That's that, and so I, that's, that's how I get to SNCC. And then I don't go back for three years. And then when I do go back, I go to Columbia. Okay. So uh, what are some of the things? I want, I, want, I want to stay here for a second. Then we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna take a leap to, black, to back to eyes in a second. Um, but what were some of the experiences that you have in the movement that then inform your work with Eyes on the Prize down the road? Okay, and I, I will preface this by saying that I was one of many who were part of this team. Yes, so that yes. what the team is doing is that they are, first of all, talking to folks like you who are beginning to write about the scholarship. Um, and then they're also, though, talking to all of these interviews, interviewees. So they are being grounded in the movement. No, no, none of the others had really come out of it. John Els had, had spent some time in the SNCC national office. And, um, and so he was shooting an early version of us. But other than that, I'm probably the one most grounded in the movement history in, through SNCC, only through SNCC. Um, but the other parts of the team are getting the grounding because they're listening to people. They are absolutely listening on these interview interviews on the phone, they're doing pre-interviews. They're listening to folks. Um, they're reading whatever they can get their hands on. So, um, but what I got, what, what I think I brought was um, the sense that it really was these regular people. I mean, where, where SNCC worked, we weren't seeing so much the Dr. King folks, right? Um, now, it didn't mean that he didn't have a whole lot of influence, but when we're looking, um, we're, when we're working in Mississippi, Alabama, Southwest Georgia, Arkansas, we are being guided and grounded by the local people there. So it's Amzi Moore who, you know, says to, to Bob, Bob Moses, who is, who is the first one who makes that incursion into Mississippi in 1961 and then 62 to stay. Um, it's Amzi Moore who says, look, you young people, and, and, and Amzi houses and closes Bob Moses, 
uh, uh, clothes Bob Moses. Um, and Amzi sits Bob down. And Bob has told us this, you know, but sits Bob down and says, look, you young people in SNCC can talk about sit-ins if you want to. But says Amzi Moore in Cleveland, Mississippi in 1962, I know that our power as Black people, he says this, our power as Black people will come through the vote. And he opens up a precinct map on his kitchen table and says to Bob Moses, SNCC director then, and says, um, but I'm not ready for you here yet, here in Cleveland. But, but C.C. Bryant is ready for you down in Southwest Mississippi, right? Now, I won't go through how that happens. They're part of this larger network of black activists through the Regional Council of Negro Leadership. I didn't know about it then, right? But that's what they're part of. They've been, you know, these are the returning World War II vets. That's the network we come into. So part of what I, I, I you know, my consciousness is that it's, it's not just these young people who did it. It's not just around the sit-in movement. It's not just, we are being grounded by all these local movements who have been plowing the ground before we ever got to them, you know? So um, that's a key piece. And the other thing is, um, again, around leadership. It's not just that they're the troops. You know, I mean, the triumvirate of Mississippi, for example, is um, Mrs. Devine coming out of Canton, Mississippi, Mrs. Hamer coming out of um, Ruleville, Mississippi, and um, Mrs. Gray coming out of Hattiesburg. And so, and Palmer's Crossing. So it's like that triumvirate of women. So you absolutely got, this is women who are also grounding this. Um, you got the young people. I mean, the young people are the folks who are pulling the adults in. So yeah, when we do freedom schools, for example, um, first of all, you want to give them an alternative way, alternative way of looking at the world these young people, but it's also a way of getting the adults involved. And so the Freedom School, which is Charlie Cobb's idea, SNCC's field secretary, um, that, that is something that um, is one of those tools, but it's also important in itself. So I'm bringing that sense of regular people who grounded the movement, who were the, the absolute foundation of the movement that we knew. Um, Mrs. Boynton, you know, when um, Bernard and Coley Lafayette go into Selma, it's, it's Mrs. Boynton who tells them what's going on. You know, it's, it's the young people that Bernard and Collier start organizing. And then um, they, you know, they're the ones who then fan out and get their, the teachers and the adults involved. Um, all of that is in Southwest Georgia. I mean, you look at, at Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan. She comes in as a, um, you know, we know her in SNCC as this amazing voice as part of the, um, SNCC Freedom Singers, but she comes out of the Southwest Georgia movement, you know? Um, and so what I got was the role that regular people played, the role that women played, the role that young people played, and also always the sense that you never knew whether the thing that you were doing was going to work. You know, you really did step out on faith. Um, and that sense of is it really going to happen? And you get that in Montgomery too. But anyway, so all of that, I think I'm, I'm, for me, I'm bringing, and then the team is getting it from all the people they're talking to and listening to and the readings they're doing and, and you know, all that. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I mean, and, and it comes across in the documentary. I mean, it, it really does. Um, the ordinary folk, the women, the voices that we just often don't hear and still don't hear. Amazing, right? I mean, oh, what, 30, 35 years later, we're still trying to get shine a light on, the, on those folk and on, on those voices. Um, you shared a couple clips. You pulled a couple clips. Do you want, you want, to, you want, to, you want, to, you want to watch some clips now from yes, Eyes on the Prize? Perfect, perfect. Okay, okay. I, let, let me stop. Let me, I, I got to do it. I got to do it. I got I to I gotta shift technical gears. <laughs> Let's see if we can pull this off. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing that screen. I'm going to start sharing another screen. Um, actually, before I do, let me just let me just give a little bit of an intro to the segment that we are going to we're going to watch. Um, the first one is from Awakenings, um, which is I'm trying to remember. This is the very first episode. The very first episode. Yeah, well, the first episode is Emma Till, and then this is Emma the second. Till. But it is you're right. It's the first hour in that the first hour. Series. Right. You're the right. first hour. The first hour. And it's on the Montgomery bus boycott. So M Montgomery bus boycott, of course, uh, is the moment where we, where Dr. King is introduced to the nation, right, to the world. Uh, this is him setting, you know, setting foot on the global stage. And often that's the story. That's as much as we get. 
We get Rosa sitting, we get King standing. But, but in eyes, we get a little bit of a, we get a lot of a different story. We're introduced to a lot of different people, um, you know, or a different organization. Suddenly the Women's Political Council, right, surfaces like, we're like, whoa, what is this, right? So I, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, let's, let's play this first clip. Uh, God help us if we can, <laughs> let's see if we can make it work. Um, and then when, when it's over, it's just four minutes. Uh, when it's over, um, I would love to get your thoughts uh, on what we just saw and also kind of what went into making it and getting this clip right here. So let, let, me, let, me, let me share. And then, let's see. All right, our first clip. Audio? Can, can you back it up so we hear the audio? Yes, can you not hear it? No, oh. I can't hear it. Okay, let me back up a little bit. Okay. We have separate taxes. Right. Uh, you have black taxes. Let me back uh, up a little bit more. I'm still not hearing the audio. No? No. John, can you hear it okay? Can anybody hear it? Okay. Can't hear it very well. Oh, Trump fine then. The little uh, sound thing on the lower left. And colored water fountains. We had separate taxis. Uh, you had black taxis and you had white taxis. And Montgomery, like all of the South, had segregated buses. In interstate buses like this one, and in city buses, the whites sat in the front, the blacks in back. If more whites got on, the blacks had to give them the middle and back seats too. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white passenger. These front seats were occupied and there's one man, a white man standing. And then at this point, the driver asked us to stand up and let him have those seats. And when... Uh, Neither, none of us moved at his first uh, words. He said, y'all make it light on yourselves and let me have those seats. And when the policeman approached me, one of them spoke and asked me if the driver had, to, had, uh, had asked me to stand. I said, yes. He said, why don't you stand up? I said, I don't think I should have to stand up. And I asked him, I said, why do you push us around? He said, I do not know, but the law is a law and you're under arrest. Mrs. Parks was formerly my secretary in the NACP and the local branch for about 12 years. She also worked with me when I was state president of the NACP. And she also assisted me uh, in the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And uh, if there ever, ever was a woman who was dedicated to the cause, Rose L. Parks was that woman. This was not the first time a black person had defied the bus segregation in Montgomery. It was not Mrs. Parks' first time. It was her first arrest. Edie Nixon went to the police station to bail her out. As Miss Parks, I said, with your permission, we can break down segregation on the bus with your keys. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, we can do it. And I said, if I wasn't convinced, I wouldn't bother anybody. She asked the mother what she thought about it. She said, I'll go along with Mr. Nixon. I asked her husband, he said, I'll support it. So that's fine. Edie Nixon and other black leaders called for a one day bus boycott. In some cities, it would have been impossible to organize 40,000 people in two days. But Black Montgomery had a core of activists in the Women's Political Council, and they distributed these boycott notices all over the city. I called every person who was in every school and every place where we had planned to be at that, have somebody at that school or wherever it was at a certain time, that I would be there with materials for them to disseminate. I didn't go to bed that night. I cut those censors. I ran off 35,000 copies. The bus passed right down. up to see it and several buses passed. I was late for work because I was trying to see how many buses was empty and they were totally empty. 
The one-day boycott was a success. That night, a mobilized black community turned out for a meeting at the Holt Street Baptist Church and voted unanimously to continue the boycott. The preachers were preaching as I came in. Uh, I was about two minutes late coming in. All right, we cut it at the right point. I, yes, I was, you did. Okay, okay. <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, so so what did we just see? What did we just see, Judy? Yes. Well, it it is against the regular narrative, which, as you said, is still the narrative. You know, it's still poor little tired Rosa Parks just couldn't get up off the seat. Okay, so one of the things we show you is that Dr. King, he's just twenty six years old. He has just gotten to town. He knows nothing about organizing. But Montgomery itself is a highly organized black community. You know, it's got the voters leagues, it's got the social organizations, it has a black college and black businesses. We tell you that Mrs. Parks, you know, um, first of all, you you get you realize from this depiction of Mrs. Parks that it's not oh poor little tired Rose Parks because if you do that to you to her, you deny to her the purposefulness of it. That this is an act of resistance. It's not just because she's tired from doing all that sewing, you know. And so one of the things it does is it says this woman knew what she was doing, you know, um, and that she's done it before. We said others had done it. So Claudette Colvin, for example, the young woman, we meant we know we, we mentioned that she's worked for E. D. Nixon, NAA head. One of the things I usually do when I talk with teachers about this is to say, who is Mr. Nixon? Well, he's one of the organizers with the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porter, A. Philip Randolph's union, you know, who is the one who proposes the 1963 March on Washington for jobs and freedom. But in 41 is doing the same thing. He's, he's, he's threatening that in World War II. So this is a man, E.D. Nixon, who taps Dr. King to be the leader of the boycott. But E.D. Nixon is a preeminent organizer himself. Um, I, we didn't get to talk about some of the things that are in Jean Theo Harris's wonderful book, um, you know, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, because we didn't have her book, just like we didn't have your book, you know. But what, for what it was and still is, it absolutely upsets the predominant narrative of, you know, poor little tired Rosa, and it's Dr. King who was the only leader. And, and one thing I would love to say, because I love E.D. Nixon, is when we interviewed him, um, and I was actually there for that, that was one of those early interviews and in, in 78, 79. And um, at some point, you know, he says in that piece, um, and he says it back then, he says, you know, it, when I first started doing this, you know, I was doing it for the children who were coming behind me, meaning all the work we're doing for this movement and all the lives that we're putting on the line, we're doing it for the folks who come behind us. Um, not thinking we're ever gonna see any change, right? So his thing is, I'm doing it for the folks who are coming behind me. And then he says in, in the piece even, um, but, you know, and then I started thinking, shoot, I want to enjoy some of this stuff myself, you know, and so you realize, though, in that little piece, what he's saying is, we did this, not necessarily knowing we would see the change we were, we were working for, we might never see it. But if you do nothing, nothing changes. And then the young people who are come behind you have to go through the same horribleness that you're going through. So, so what you see in there are, you know, you can really plug off of E.D. Nixon, Rosa Parks, we also say, you know, they did, they thought it was going to be one day. You know, mm. the other thing I would just mention is I I, I will say I actually found uh, Joanne Robinson because during that early stage, I'm sitting there by myself in the room and I'm looking through stuff and I'm looking through Stride Toward Freedom, which is Dr. King's account of the boycott, you know. And finally, oh, my God, I come across the name of a woman. And so it's Joanne Robinson. So I think, OK, how am I going to find her? Uh, and I actually called Garrow, Dave Garrow, and because uh, he had a ro whole Rolodex. And I said, um, I asked him, he said, well, you know, I think she's a, uh, um, a teacher in LA because I had already called SCLC Atlanta, Alabama. Okay, so I now know maybe she's a teacher in LA. I call one of the first black reporters at the New York Times, C. Gerald Fraser. And I said, Gerald, how am I gonna find this woman? And clearly I had, asked him too many times about where do I, how do I do this? And so he says in this very tired voice, um, you know, Judy, sometimes people are listed in the phone book. <laughs> and she was, I mean, I actually found her in the phone book, you know, cause this is before, you know, 
internet and all that stuff. So I call her and she is so pleased that somebody is interested in her story. That's the whole thing about oral histories. You know, it really validates folks' experiences. And so I call her and she starts telling me the, the story, a piece of which is in Eyes on the Prize, right? And she talks about how, you know, she said, well, you know, um, Fred Gray called me, he was on a run. He's the attorney, the, the black attorney in Alabama, right? He couldn't be there because he was at, on another case somewhere out of town. Um, so um, Virginia Durr and her husband Clifford Durr, the two white folks who were kind of, the, you know, the liberals in the middle of, of Montgomery, they go to get Mrs. Parks out of jail. Okay, so, and you see uh, Mrs. Durr in, in the segment as well. Okay, so, but what, what um, Joanne Robinson says is, okay, so Fred tells me, I then, she said, and she's telling me this over the phone in 1979, Joanne Robinson is. She says, so then I called my co-chair, Mrs. Mary Fair Burks. And um, uh, Mrs. Burke said, you, we have the plan, let's put it into action. And so it's because they had already thought about, okay, if this happens, what do we do? Um, not that they knew it was gonna be Mrs. Parks, they didn't, but so many people, men, women, black folks, had been disrespected and brutalized on the buses, mm -hmm. the main public transport for most of Black Montgomery, right? Because most folks didn't have cars. So, um, so this is, so uh, Joanne Robinson says, so um, she said, we have the plan, let's put it into action. And what that was, was a telephone tree. They already had in the plan, okay, one person calls these five people, calls these five people, calls, so that by the end of that night, all of Black Montgomery, uh, all of the Women's Political Council, knows that Mrs. Parks has been arrested. Okay, Joanne Robinson, as she says in the segment, she goes to her college, the Black College, Montgomery State, runs off, because mimeograph, right? Runs off um, 35,000 copies. Um, and then she takes one, two of her students in the car. She has already called the other women in the political council, women's political council. They're the, 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 the teachers and the principals in the Black schools. Joanne Robinson says to me on this phone call, and, and so I stopped by each of the black schools. There was a student there um, to accept the, the leaflets that she had done. And she said, without a word being said, that student went from the curb into the school and, and then the leaflets got passed out. And so then, you know, and the leaflet, by the way, doesn't even say, let's do, um, you know, a, a 365, a 380, oops, see Daisy, 387 day mac, uh, 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 boycott. What they say is let's do a one day boycott and they don't sign it because they don't want to get anybody into trouble. And then, you know, the ministers meet on Saturday, they preach about it on Sunday. Monday comes, nobody's on the buses, mm -hmm. but nobody, it's like uh, uh, Mrs. Belcher says, they don't know whether it's going to work yeah. and it's only going to be one day. So, yeah. but what we do is we change the way people see that boycott. It's not just Dr. King coming in from on high and saying, we're going to do a boycott, you know. It is these local people who have the network because he's new. He doesn't know all these people. So that's, that's yeah, that's and, uh, that's That's amazing. We have, um, we still have two more clips and we're going to get to those. Uh, but we have a wonderful, um, a question from one of our, from one of the attendees, Amy Smith. And I want to, I want to, I want to direct that to you because I think it's, it, it connects to what we just saw. And, and she asks, um, uh, what a, a two-parter, but this is the first part. Why do you believe that the power and force that local people had during the movement was slash has been overlooked, not highly discussed, uh, not publicized? Well, I, I do think it's pur purposeful. I mean, they really, because there is a power that comes from knowing that we were the ones who did the movement. There is an absolute power. Cause again, if you think you've done it before, you know, you can do it again. They don't want us to know that. They don't want us to know that. And they don't want us to know about the successes, the little ones. You always have to celebrate also the little successes, not just all the big ones, right? Um, and so the very fact that you could go in and um, do voter registration and get the, I mean, people talk about mass meetings, right? And and they and and young organizers now will come to me and say, well, I must be doing something wrong because you know you all had you know three hundred people in a mass meeting. Nah, at the beginning you could have yourself, your local organizer, and her mother, all three of you in a mass meeting, right? So, but nobody stopped. I mean, that was the thing. Violence didn't stop it. Threats of firing didn't stop it. But if you know that those local people were the ones, then you know you can do it again. So that's that's the, the thing. And it's purposeful. Purposeful, purposeful. 
um, let, let's, let's get to that second clip. Um, it's from the promised land. And is this one about Birmingham? No, this is the one that is about uh, Dr. King and um, uh, talking about the um, radical redistribution of economic power. Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes now, yes. let me ask you, should I, should I, I I'm talking too much because I do want to get no. to Attica too. No, we'll get there. We'll get there. We got time. Okay. We're okay. not going anywhere. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but this, but this is an aspect and part, part of what we talked about, um, you talked about sort of the, the movement being too always obsessed with King, right? But it's, but yes, not the movement, but how we remember the movement, but it's never the King that we need to be focusing on. So let's, 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 let's put in uh, this second clip. Um, it runs about five minutes and let's see if we can, we, the Royal we, let's see if I can do this. No, honey, I'm not doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> let's see if I can get this right. Okay. Oh, wait, hold on. Mm -hmm. But now, above all, was the time to deliver. SCLC staff meeting, the Ebenezer Baptist Church, Atlanta. King's closest aides were unsure about the poor people's campaign. What could it accomplish? Could they mobilize a nationwide movement? Was King's nonviolence perceived as being too conservative? And this is why I said the most radical guy lived in the 20th century was Martin Luther King Jr. It took a radical cat. Let me say my thing and then I'll listen it up. I said the most radical cat lived in the 20th century was Martin Luther King Jr. It took a radical cat to put 50,000 black people in Alabama off buses. The question, as I understood it, was not the fact that Dr. King didn't do anything. It wasn't the issue. The issue was, if we're going to take people on a go for broke, what are we going to be able to return back to Mississippi with in our hands? What are we going to be able to return back to Chicago with in our hands? And what Carlos, as I understood, was saying, I'd like you to state that if, he, if we're not, then let's just say we're not going to do that, and then he'll know. And if we are, say we are. Can I speak to that, though? Because, no, 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 no. This is not nonsense, okay? If the thing becomes the demands, and then you don't come back with the demands, you're in trouble. I don't think we can give anybody any guarantees so that we reached a point where we almost are where the Jews are when Hitler took power. That are you going to sit by and wait until you put in a concentration camp or you're going to organize and fight? Now, I don't know whether we're going to win or lose or draw or what we're going to bring back. And I, but I'm not going to sit by and let the liberal wing or the progressive forces in the Negro community get chopped up. I'm going to fight. And if we, Martin and usually could bring us together, but he always let us fight it out for ourselves for a long time. The only time he really got mad with me was when I wouldn't disagree with everybody. Uh, he sort of expected me to be the conservative one. And because a movement needed wild ideas and radical notions, but it also needed to be pulled back into perspective to do something that was actually doable and attainable. And I got tired of being the, the uh, you know, the, the reactionary. So I just said, that's right, that's right. That's exactly what we ought to do. And he jumped up and got mad. He said, Andy, he said, if you don't express, <laughs> he said, if you don't, you know, end up giving the conservative view, you don't leave me any room to come down in the middle. Now, some folks celebrate Abraham Lincoln, but we're going to celebrate Mapa Luther King's day today. Don't let him out of here. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. You are my president, Linda Johnson. And, and we know how you're supporting everything. I got this little cup for you, and I want this back because it's mine. And it says, let me read it. says, we are cooperating with Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty. Drop coins and bills in the cup. And we <laughs> Martin Luther King was 39 years old. 
King began to recruit volunteers and raise money for the new campaign, scheduled to start in less than two months. See you. All right. We organized the Poor People's Campaign by putting out what is known in the movement as a call, a call to worship, a call to participate, a call for camaraderie and so on. Whoever hears your call will respond. When I call you, it means I need you and you will come. understand is this, that it didn't cost the nation one penny to integrate lunch counters. It didn't cost the nation one penny to guarantee the right to vote. But now we are dealing with issues that cannot be solved without the nation spending billions of dollars undergoing a radical redistribution of economic power. Yes, yes. We had sunshine in Birmingham. Back in Atlanta, in his pastor's study, King and his aides prepared for a Okay, that's not the king that we usually hear from or about. What was the, what was what was the processing and the thinking about that episode and 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 getting that king on camera in many dimensions? I mean, it's the king talking about radical redistribution of wealth. It's the king having a moment of levity and, and, and smiling and laughing and being celebrated, sort of a, kind of an intimate moment. And then it's, it's his, the, the folk around him trying to figure this thing out as well. So, so, so what do we have there? What do we have there? And that's exactly what it is. I mean, people get amazed, first of all, that people are arguing about something, you know, that he has proposed, you know, that it wasn't just a given that Dr. King would say something and then the staff would just say, oh, yes, sir, we will now go ahead and do this. Um, that people are, are really having this argument. And then to see that smile on his face at the end, you know, let's hear it for the editors, you know, I mean, and the producer, I mean, there, there's a way that they constructed a different way of looking at King that was, um, and I can say they, because I'm not sitting in the edit room while they're doing this, with the, this segment. It's, it was beautifully done. And, um, and I will say what, what's great about it too, is that it allows you, first of all, to see um, that the movement is talking about economic justice, because oftentimes what young folks will say is, you know, y'all just kept talking about the sit-ins, you know, and sitting down next to white people. And no, that's not all we were doing. You know, I mean, we were doing economic justice stuff. Certainly with, with SNCC in, in Mississippi, it's local people who come off the plantations and take over the Green Greenville Air Force Base. You know, um, we're always talking about economic issues. And and I would just mention it here because um, you will you would see it later in the King seg earlier actually in the King segment on the Vietnam War piece because that that whole hour is devoted to Dr. King, and his last year, and so you see him coming out against the Vietnam War. But you also have a, a, a little bite, interview bite from Stokely Carmichael, now Kwame Touré, where he says, you know, Dr. King, um, you know, called me and said, you know, you need to come to my church because, um, and, and Stokely says, well, I don't know, you know, I'm going to be busy. Uh, and so King says, uh, Dr. King says, well, um, I'm going to come out against the Vietnam War. And that's before he goes to National Cathedral, right? And um, so Stokely says in the segment, he says, well, I'm going to be at your, at your church first thing in the morning. And the archivists, the folks who do all that archival research, they found that bite of um, Stokely and Cleveland Sellers, Cleve Sellers, both SNCC people, standing up right after King says what he says in the church in Atlanta. Um, but the other thing to know that is that SNCC, in the same way that it had come out against the Vietnam War, had also before that, in terms of economic justice and that wonderful piece of you know redistribution of economic power. Um, that and he talks against capitalism, but that's not in that's not in eyes. But um, but in terms of the um, the the economic justice piece, 
I always remember, I re remind people, you know, the speech that John gives, the SNCC speech that John Lewis gives as chairman of SNCC at the March on Washington, that SNCC speech says a lot of stuff, but the, the main thing is economic justice. I mean, you know, the SNCC speech begins with, we march today for jobs and freedoms, but we have nothing to be proud of for hundreds and thousands of our brothers and, and sisters are not here for their receiving starvation wages or no wages at all. That's the opening of the SNCC speech that John Lewis delivers. And then one other line, he says, we need a bill that will ensure the equality of a maid who earns $5 a week in the home of a family whose total income is $100,000 a year. And he's talking about what this new 1964 proposed civil rights bill does not do. You know? So I think you know, to understand what you're seeing about Dr. King in the context of others in the movement who also are understanding this. I mean, the first, the first um, real opposition to the Vietnam War actually comes out of Macomb, Mississippi, and it's a SNCC chapter. It's a, it's a, a chapter, you know, it's a, a chapter. It's, it's a project that SNCC um, is, is organizing. And it's really coming from the local people. I mean, they are tired of seeing their brothers and their uncles going over to do this war and they can't sit down at a lunch counter. I mean, come on, they can't get a housing loan. They can't get um, loans from the agriculture department for their crops. None of that has happened and they're, getting, they're dying in some faraway place. So Macomb, Mississippi, is a place where that first is 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 located in Macomb, Mississippi. You know, we have um, a number of questions, and I want to I want to toss uh, combine a couple and toss them uh, to to you here. Um, one person asks about uh, King is talking about the uh, Poor People's Campaign there, um, and there's a revitalized Poor People's Campaign now with uh, Reverend Barber. Uh, and thinking about sort of those connections between the two. Say hi to Miss Judy. Oh, hi. hey there. Hi, how you doing? Um, <laughs> wait, wait, name, what? what? This is Alayla. Alayla, hello, Alayla. Alayla. Alayla, yeah. Pretty name. Now she's all, all right, okay. so people are gonna join here. Okay, we're good. So, so one is, um, how do we get, the, the question was, how do you get, how do you think you get people to connect with this new, uh, poor people's campaign, but but we also have a question from Erica. I mean, that's kind of movement. Failed. Okay, Shh. no, you didn't fail. That's a, make you that, did. Oh, you gave me an F. Oh my god. So <laughs> you see, a teacher, man. Um, but the other one was, what inspired you to use film? As Wait, a, I'm sorry, I didn't get the the first one. The so, first one. so one, it, the, the first one was about how do you how do you think you can get people uh, to sort of take the lessons of the first poor people's campaign and then get involved, perhaps. Uh, in this new iteration, which is kind of an activist uh, question. Mm -hmm. an extent. And, and I think it's always what organizers know, which is you take people where they are. I mean, I went, I went to the Whole Food as much as I hate doing it because now, you know, Jeff Bezos has this and it's Amazon and I hate Amazon. I hate, okay. But, um, but I'm talking to the guy who I always see, you know, black guy um, from DC. And he says, um, you know, uh, he was really worried because there were neighbors of his who were getting evicted. Now, um, what you need, though, is some local organizer who's then going to say, we need to band together and we need to start talking about how you begin organizing, but you tell, you take it from where they are already. So it's, it, yeah, it would help to understand um, uh, the Poor People's Campaign and the Poor People's Campaign National now, but the main thing is you got to go local. It's always local. People have to understand it through their own experiences. Um, and folks are getting evicted, you know. Um, it's it's like the occupation movement. You know, the, I, I love that they, they, you know, got the idea of, you know, this is what capitalism does kind of, you know, I mean, I understand that. But what they unfortunately did is they stayed where they were. And so, um, except in Detroit, you know, they, they were talking about, um, or um, uh, some of the Occupy people in Detroit back then were working with local organizers who were fighting evictions in Detroit. That was back then. So always it is, you, you, you have to start where folks are and what they're experiencing now. It, it can't just be history. Start, start where the people are. I mean, that's, 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 that's organizing 101. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Erica, uh, and then we will, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that third clip on Attica. Erica asks, what inspired you to use film as a vehicle for social change? Well, truthfully, that's putting the cart before the horse. 
Um, it is only because I come out, um, I'm, I'm moving up to boys, uh, Boston, and Henry says, oh, you know, I'd given him a chronology before. I don't know that I knew it was because, oh, this is going to be about the movement. This is great. Um, SNCC was always about education. So I always had that, you know, within me. The bookstore was that, you know, it's always that. But, um, but I'm not sure I understood it until I get through Eyes on the Prize. And when I start talking about these are the main issues, for example, that you can see through the themes that come out of Eyes on the Prize. It's not always spontaneous. It takes planning, you know, it's the regular people's. These themes are not themes that we were working with when we first started, nor are they things that I think about, you know, that this is gonna be my life's work. I never think that. I think this is gonna be, you know, this is really interesting. I love these people I'm working with. We are doing good things. Um, and I can see how it can be used for organizing now, but I don't think it's gonna be that. It's, I, I, you know, I, I just kind of fall into it. Um, what was great is that SNCC had given me the skills, both in terms of experiences and also just in terms of lots of skills that I got through SNCC. You know, how you listen so I could do a good interview because I listen to people, you know, all there are a lot of stuff. Um, and so it, that I brought in, but I, I, did, I didn't know that. I didn't know it then. It, it's it's hard to look into the future. Yes. Uh, but but it's but what we see, I think, in the the trajectory of your life's work is that it's constantly building on these past experiences and always drawing back. Not only you talked about your mother and your and your dad, I mean, always building uh, on these important life experiences and then applying it uh, to what to what comes next. That's, yes. that's, that's, that's amazing. Okay. So let's 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 watch this third clip. Um, and, and this is a little, this is a little tough one, uh, because this is, we're in this moment where we're dealing with, um, criminal justice, we're talking about police violence, um, and what we see today is not new. Um, and, and one of the things that's one of the po most powerful, I would say, um, uh, episodes, uh, and segments in eyes, and this one is in eyes too has to deal with the Attica uprising. Uh, and so you have that clip and I'm gonna, I'm gonna share that now and then we will, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit on the, on the back end. I'm getting good at this, Judy. Yeah, you are. thing William Kunstler has said that people are dying in there and I agree with that I think that there are people that are dying in there and the scene is, is I'm, I'm gonna cut this off uh, helicopters are still flying overhead it seems there was an announcement from the helicopter right above me to the inmates below that they should put their hands on their heads and come out. I don't know whether anyone has died inside. And I'm upset. It's, it's unfortunate what has happened here. Whatever happens, uh, after the situation here in Attica, a penal system here in the United States and the people who are kept in this out of them will never be the same. As the inmates surrendered, they were herded into an adjacent yard. to strip, lay in the mud, face down, and crawl to a guard 10 to 20 feet away from the guard that had you stripped. Uh, at that point, that guard would mark an X with white chalk on the back of 
select inmates who were then removed from the mud physically by two additional guards placed in a line to run a gauntlet of correction officers to be beaten all the way to another cell block. You know, you gotta let me explain it this way. You know, it was very, very barbaric, you know, very, very cruel, you know, and I'm, you know, and I really feel it. You know, what they really did, you know, they ripped our clothes off. They made us crawl on the ground like we were animals. You know, and they snatched me and they, they laid me on the table, you know, and they beat me in my testicles and they buried me with cigarettes and they dropped hot shells on me and they put a football up under my throat and they kept telling me that if it dropped, they was going to kill me. And I really felt, you know, after seeing so many people shot for no apparent reason that we really were going to do this. Armed rebellion of the type we have faced threatens the destruction of our free society. We cannot permit that destruction to happen. It has indeed been an agonizing decision. We had predicted the day before that it was going to be a massacre. Uh, Herman Badillo turned to me and said, I don't know what the hurry was. He said, there's always time to die. And I don't know what the hurry was either. You know, those guys weren't going anywhere. They were inside 30 foot walls. It was, uh, it was uh, a September. It was getting cold up there. The food was running out. The sanitary conditions were bad. The place smelled awful. I mean, that sense of freedom that the guys had had to begin with, but, but just before being out of their cells, that was beginning to wear away in the reality of their situation. I don't know what the hurry was. They could have waited two days, three days, four days. Those guys would have given up. They didn't have to go in and kill them all. Mm. They didn't have to go in and kill them all. You know, one of the- And, and just so you know, the last line that got, that got cut off was, but they did. Oh, and that's what but he they says did. at the end. But they did, absolutely. They didn't have to go in and kill them all, but they did. And this isn't Alabama. This isn't Mississippi. Uh, this isn't the 1940s or 50s. This is 1970s New York, upstate New York to be particular, right? I mean, that's supposed to be nice up there, right? I mean, this is, uh, so Attica, I mean, tell me what, what did, did, one of the things in, in creating a, a documentary, and uh, even if you have 14 hours, you, you can't tell the, you can't tell every story, but I cho chose you all chose to tell the story of Attica. Why was that so important then? And clearly it's important now, but what was the, what was the thinking and also the foreshadowing, my goodness, uh, to include that, that story uh, in, in the documentary? Well, I think, you know, when we started doing research on it, um, the I, Attica was one of the stories, just like um, the Orangeburg massacre was initially one of the stories. Um, at which is the you know 1968 shooting of three black students at South Carolina State College on their own campus, um, and uh, by state police. So there were a lot of things, and there was a lot of discussion about Attica because um, I will say Henry didn't really initially see it as a civil rights story, mm -hmm. and it's because there were those on the staff who knew it, and it was, wasn't just I. I. There, there were other people who. We're, we're really saying this is an important story. And, and it is groundbreaking that we put the Attica uprising, uh, the prison revolt in a documentary on the civil rights movement, that that, that becomes a, a, a key piece. Um, and, and the other thing is what's, and obviously in terms of the, um, of, of foreshadowing what happens now in mass incarceration and stuff. I mean, what's interesting is that it's in the same hour as um, the assassinations of Fred Hampton, of Black Panthers, yeah. Chicago Black Panthers, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, um, and, and, and the uh, um, COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence uh, spying on um, progressive organizations and African-American organizations. So that's in that hour, um, a, a nation of law, question mark, that's, that's the title of that hour. Mm -hmm. So, um, What's interesting though, is that when you see that, um, and if you see the whole piece, what you see is that the same spin that is that the right wing is now doing about the takeover, the insurrection um, at the Capitol 
was done there and was also done in Chicago with Hampton and Clark. A spin that says they're the ones to blame. So initially in Hampton Clark, and you see it in Eyes on the Prize, you know, the cops initially say, hey, they were shooting at us. Well, they were stupid enough to leave the, the, the door open. And so the Black Panthers start coming in and showing the community and you see it in the footage, in the footage. Mm -hmm. um, and you see these regular people just coming from the South side and the West side coming in to see the, the place and all of the bullet holes are going in. They're not going out, right? Okay, so that's there. Then with this, with Attica, what you see is initially Governor Rockefeller says that the, the inmates were the ones who killed the, um, uh, let's see, there were all together 10 correctional um, uh, folks who were killed, uh, including civilian employees, and then 33 inmates. Well, what Governor Rockefeller, the Republican governor of New York at that time says is, and he was considered a, a moderate. Um, what he says is the inmates killed all those people and they castrated them. He says that, and um, Oswald, who was the, the corrections head mm -hmm. says, that's what they did. And the, then you see then, and we put all that in the, in the, in the piece. Um, then they find the medical examiner comes out and says they weren't castrated. And, and by the way, he says, you don't have to be a medical examiner to know when somebody has been castrated, you know? So, um, but even during that, you see press conferences that are very similar between Hampton and Clark and Chicago and their assassination and what happens to the guys in, in, in the prison in Attica. And the way that spin starts happening. In the way, as I said, that you know, they're saying, oh, it's really Antifa and it's really, you know, Black Lives Matter people. No, no, it's right wing way. So the, the that kind of spin is what you see in both in both of those stories. But in Attica, I've just I've got to also say that um, the personal story is when I see Big Black, Big Black was somebody, I mean, he really was, he was a bear of a man. Okay, and I first contacted him by by the by phone. You know, and I'm doing this pre-interview with him on the phone and he seems so gruff and it's like kind of scary. Okay, so I go with Sam Pollard, who by the way, did that the new thing uh, on MLK and, J, J, uh, and FBI, that film, that documentary that is getting so much play now. Sam started as a producer on Eyes 2 and he did the initial interview, he did the interview with Big Black. Okay, so I'm going with him, with Sam Pollard. We're going to interview Big Black, we're gonna do the film and so, Sam and the crew are unloading the equipment. I go up to the to the um, this apartment, and I knock on the door. And Big Black opens the door, and he really is tall, and I'm a little short person. Okay, and so I'm kind of, and he says, "Hello, Jenny Richardson. How are you doing?" Because that's the way I sound when I get nervous. And he starts saying, "Hello, Jenny Richardson. How are you?" Doing? And he does a circle in front of the doorway. <laughs> And then he, he cracks up and I crack up and it's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> but at that interview, so everybody comes in, Sam is an amazing interviewer. And at first when Sam asks Big Black, who's Big Black Smith, to tell him the story, Black is holding back yeah. because he knows once he opens up this floodgate. So, but because he, Big Black has such trust in Sam as an interviewer and as a person. He finally, Sam says, tell me what it was really like. And that's when you get that bite that you just saw because he, he, he got it. You know, I mean, there was a connection. That's what it is. There was a connection. Yeah. And it comes across. It really yeah. comes across. And I think that's one of the things that Eyes does. Um, it humanizes the people who were at the heart of the movement, it humanizes black folk, it humanizes activists, it even humanizes the heroes, um, those who we put on these uh, on the pedestals. It, it, it puts them, it brings them back and puts them among us. Judy Richardson, it's the top of the hour. We, we, we're, we are out of time. Can I say we one are, last thing? Yeah, absolutely, you can. Teachers, teachers, everybody should go to Teaching for Change because I saw one piece that wants wanted to know how you teach this stuff. Teaching for Change is called teachingforchange.org or Zen Education Project, zened.org. And uh, Hassan and Jean Theo Harris and others are going to be in our three week. NEH Teacher Institute yes. at, well, it's going to be Zoom now, uh, but we did it last time at, at, at Duke University. Go to Teaching for Change if you're a teacher uh, and a class, a teacher, librarian, whatever, um, grades um, six through 12, uh, apply. 
And, and, and also you can find wonderful resources about how to use Eyes on the Prize in the classroom. This isn't just something uh, that, it, one, it is something that we should be using in the classroom at all grade levels, uh, but then also at home as well. So be sure to check it out. Uh, it's timeless uh, and really it, it, it still hits the mark and still resonates. Um, it's just rich history told so wonderfully, wonderfully well. Judy Richardson, thank you so much oh, for taking the time Thank you, Hassan. You've been out. wonderful. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And thank you for everyone for, for tuning in. Um, thank you to the 1619, everyone on the planning committee and who makes this happen. Uh, the video uh, of the recording will be made available uh, so you can check it out. Uh, and please go to the website. We'll be having uh, in a couple weeks another um, 1619 Legacies, and we'll actually be dealing with and looking at um, a police violence. Uh, and criminal justice reform. So uh, the, the, the hits will keep coming. We're still doing this deep dive into this important history. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Thank you, Judy. Um, everyone take care, uh, be safe and be well.